On one side you have the normal metal, other side you have superconducting metal, and there's a strong magnetic field, uh, which is just enough to keep those two in equilibrium. It's not a sharp boundary, but instead, the state of con the degree of condensation into superconducting state varies smoothly over this coherence length. But now the magnetic field, the magnetic field starts to decrease as soon as there's any superconductivity present. So the magnetic field behaves like that. And now you have magnetic boundary there and the physical boundary, as you might say, between normal and superconductor there, and they're separated. And if the magnetic boundary lies outside the physical boundary there, uh, you get a positive surface energy. Uh, and, it's th and it's that which makes the transition so sharp uh, that it, the, the material does not like to be split into little bits. Uh, it, 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 it would like to have either perfectly normal or perfectly superconducting without any unnecessary boundaries. And, and that, that is what is called a type 1 superconductor, uh, where uh, the normal and superconducting are firmly separated. But if the coherence length is much shorter, then the degree of condensation goes from normal superconducting very fast, and the magnetic field now starts falling like that. There's the physical boundary. There's the magnetic boundary, halfway down. And now the magnetic boundary is inside the physical boundary, and that gives a negative surface energy, which means that when you have a field somewhere close to the critical one, the material would love to split, to split up into little bits, love to have as many boundaries as possible, because that lowers the energy, the, the bound, negative boundary energy uh, uh, makes it split. And that is a typical type 2 superconducting behaviour. So we have this expression for the surface energy. And whether this surface energy is positive or negative depends upon which is the larger. For what we call type 1 superconductors, Xi is always greater than lambda. But if Xi were to be less than lambda, then the surface energy becomes negative. Then the superconductor might well split into normal and superconducting regions. This problem of the surface energy was tackled by Ginzburg and Landau. They, of course, did it in a much more physically and mathematically correct way, but their result is very similar. What they did do was to define a parameter kappa and showed that the critical value of uh, kappa, which leads to a negative surface energy, is when kappa is equal to 1 over root 2. They stated for any known superconductor that the value of kappa was always smaller than 1 over root 2, so they never looked at the consequences of the larger value of kappa. But 
Abrikosov did look at these solutions and discovered, amongst other things, that the superconductor divided itself between normal and superconducting regions was that flux entered in quantized flux vortices. We also have the length lambda associated with each of the vortices. So it's very nice to see that if you change the field, there will be more or less overlap between the lambdas of the separate vortices, which makes it very obvious that for small fields, you will have separated flux lines. And if you increase the field, the vortex density increases and the separation decreases and you have a more or less large overlap between the single vortices. Having stated that within a superconductor the magnetic field is zero, we now have a situation in which, although the material remains superconducting, the magnetic field inside is not zero. That this is important for the achievement of high magnetic fields. At very, very far from uh, uh, the core, the current is strictly zero because we have an exponential decay. This is the relationship, if you remember, between the current, number density, electron charge, mass, uh, the phase, or the, the gradient of the phase of the uh, wave function, and E is the vector potential. So, in a normal superconductor, we have a hole. We do this integral well away from any shielding currents that might be flowing around this hole. So we're doing it in a point where J equals zero. And we say that because the order parameter must be single valued, this has to equal zero. So if this equals zero, then h bar grad phi has got to be equal to E times A. The flux in that loop is equal to um, h bar times 2 pi times N over 2E. magnetic field rising to some value at the center of the vortex over the characteristic different distance lambda and the superconducting wave function falling to zero at the core of the vortex over the characteristic distance psi. The magnetic field, the flux quantum, is maintained by circulating supercurrents around the vortices. A precursor vortex lives inside the bulk of a superconductor. So an a precursor vortex has a core, this magnetic field, which suppresses the superconductivity in the center of the a precursor vortex with a diameter of about the Coulomb's length. The order parameter is depressed. This core is a normal superconductor. And across, around the core, with a width of the London penetration depth, for a few times London penetration depth, we have the screening currents which flow around it. If an apricorsor vortex is moving, it moves including its normal core, which means that the, during moving, the vortex has to break up the superconducting condensate at the spot where it's moving to, and behind it, the superconducting condensate condensates out again. Actually, it's not the flux which is quantized, but it's the fluxoid. In this region, the contribution from the magnetic field goes to zero and the contribution from the current dominates. Because actually here is really a vortex, you have like a tornado, a lot of uh, flux and uh, the velocity is extremely high. For what we call a type 1 superconductor, induction, staying at zero up to the critical field HC and then uh, the superconductor goes normal and now the induction is just equal to H. But in a material for which kappa is greater than 1 over root 2, which we call a type 2 superconductor, we find that flux is excluded up to a lower field, HC1. Then these quantized flux vortices begin to enter the superconductor until we get to the stage where 
the cores, are, the vortices are so close together that their cores begin to overlap. And this corresponds to what we call HC2, the upper critical field.